All right. We're going to be all over the place tonight, but our central passage is going to be in John 7, as you already knew. But uh, before we get started in John 7, I want to refer back to John 4. So if you have your Bibles, and those who are spiritual will, look in John 4, and we're going to read two or three verses about the woman at the well, and we're going to be talking a little bit about water, because we're going to be talking about water in John 7, and I want you to refer back to this and uh, tie the two together. So John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Drop down to verse 13. Jesus answered, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Abba Father, thank you so much for your word and how it tells us who you are and how it glorifies you and how it shows us our need of you because we try to substitute ourselves for who you are making ourselves God please forgive us for doing that our Father we ask tonight that you would open our hearts those that don't have new hearts that you would give them a new heart that you would open our spiritual ears to hear <coughs> and your spirit would apply to us your message of grace May we hear the soft sound of sandals feet as we look at Jesus tonight. And may we see Him and Him only. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now, looking briefly in verse 10, I, this is uh, kind of goes to what you were talking about, even though I had no idea what you were going to be talking about tonight. Um, he says, if you knew the gift of God. Then who is the gift of God? Notice I didn't say, what is the gift of God? I said, who is the gift of God? It's Jesus. He said, if you knew Jesus, talking about himself. And who it is who says to you, and we're not going to read any more out of here tonight, but he goes on to tell her that he's the Messiah. The one person that the whole world has always looked for is the Messiah. I mean, you might, if you're expecting a baby, you're not expecting the Messiah, are you? <laughs> now, if you're a Jew, you might be, but the Messiah's come and gone. So they're looking for a false Messiah. But he says, if you knew the gift of God, see, he was showing her and us our ignorance of who the gift is. You would have asked him for a drink. Because he said that the water that you have in this well, you will get thirsty again. But I am living water. And whoever drinks of me, as we, we can refer back to John 6, will never thirst again. So let's go over to chapter 7, verse 37. 7, verse 37. Remember, Jesus had gone to this feast, and his brothers said, Go and let everybody know who you were. And he says, I'm not yet going up to this feast. And uh, then after they left, he went 
different way and uh, went in secret. But on the last day, now Jesus is in the temple. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture says, has out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You know, um, the Holy Spirit was active. Don't get me wrong. He was active because you can't believe about the Holy Spirit. No one says Jesus is Lord apart from the Spirit. But there was a special way that was coming on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit was going to be indwelled in believers. Now before then, He kind of walked along the side. And notice I said He. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. His Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And they were all one essence in the past. And then, when Jesus became flesh, He changed in it because He took on a new nature. So he, he kept His old nature, but He had a new nature. And He is no longer spirit only. Now this is hard to believe, but Jesus can be ubiquitous. That means everywhere. And yet local. Because He sits at the right hand of the Father, right? But it, um, you would think, well, if He's there, He can't be everywhere. But He did not give up His deity and God is Spirit. And He's everywhere. Now, I can't explain all that. I just know the Bible teaches it. So you have to take my word for it. Or take, no, don't take my word for it. Take the Bible's word for it. Now, how many of you you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever engaged in apologetics on the resurrection of Christ? Almost all of us, probably. Now, have you ever, by your eloquence, are all the facts you give convinced anybody of the resurrection of Christ? I haven't either. Now, I want to we're going to look at some things here about the Holy Spirit and about the resurrection tonight because as important as the cross is, without the resurrection, the cross is meaningless. The cross is extremely important. It's the most important thing that we talk about and the resurrection is the most important thing we talk about. You can't have one without the other because the cross vindicates the justice of God and the resurrection vindicates what Christ did by raising Him from the dead. You see, rightly so, the enemies of Christ concentrate their attention on destroying the bodily resurrection of Christ. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but this past week, Yesterday, I think to be exact, I read an article where the, and I don't know if it's a real article or not, but the Pope said that Christ did not bodily rise from the dead, only spiritually. Now, like I say, I don't know if that's true or not, but we do know that certain people that claim to be Christians teach that, such as the JWs. They teach that, but they're not Christians either. But the apostles did not preach that way. You see, um, we could, and I'm, we're going to look briefly at some resurrection facts. But there are two ways that we present the resurrection as a church. The first is the Spirit reveals Him to us. The second is that we have historical legal evidence is and that's what I was talking about when we're talking to people about the resurrection and we give them a list of facts. I got these five facts and I'm gonna give you five facts and if 
shortly. And they all begin with an E, so you can <laughs> remember immediately. But, um, and I got those from Gary Habermas, so if you are familiar with him, you know that they're good facts. But we're not going to rely on the good facts. We're going to rely on the Holy Spirit. Now, when the apostles were preaching, they did not come up to somebody and say, hey, I want you to look at these facts here. And if you believe these facts, you know, I'm going to convince you to become a Christian. But I want you to look briefly in Acts 26. I got these marks, so maybe I can move to them real quick. Um, <coughs> Paul is talking to uh, King Agrippa. He says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our twelve tribes earnestly serving God, night and day hope to attain for this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you, because he knew all this, see, that God raises the dead. Can you really honestly, rationally think that you could go through life and do all you want or not want because you didn't have anything or if you, you were blessed with everything, that there's no afterlife? But could you put that in a test tube and prove it? And that's what he's telling Agrippa. God raises the dead. It makes sense. <clears throat> but, just because it makes sense doesn't mean you can prove it. So, the apostles did not use, I'm going to prove it approach. They just proclaimed it. He said, I'm proclaiming to you the resurrection of the dead. Look in Acts 13. Just a few pages over and I'm going to be moving through. I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm just going to read selected verses. Verse 17, The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers, exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm He brought them out of it. Verse 22, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. Down to 26. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. The ones that fear God are the Gentiles. They weren't Jews. Those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know Him nor even the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath have fulfilled them in condemning Him. They fulfilled prophecy. The Jews fulfilled prophecy by killing their Messiah. How about that for a, a fulfilling of prophecy? And though they found no cause for death in Him, they asked Pilate that he should put Him to death. You remember when they went up and told Pilate and said, we, the law does not allow us to put anyone to death. Did Jews put people to death? They stoned them, didn't they? Yeah. But what did Jesus say? If I am lifted up, who crucified people? The Romans. So they had to take him to Pilate. And they were oblivious to what really, I think, in all honesty, of what they were doing. When they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, verse 29, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. 32, And we declare to you glad tidings that the promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus as it is written, You are my son today, I have forgotten you. Amen. Now you, didn't, you don't hear him bringing out the five basic facts there, do you? No. He just proclaimed it like it was a fact because it was a fact. Paul said in 15 chapter of 1 Corinthians, 
if Christ is not risen from the dead, of all people, we're the most miserable. We're wasting our life. So how do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, the Holy Spirit reveals that to us through what is called being born again or regeneration or being made alive. Many in the evangelical church, and we're evangelicals, broadly speaking, we're what, New Covenant Baptist or whatever, Reformed Baptist, Confessional Baptist. We're not Southern Baptist, but we're, we're Baptist. Go around and try to tell people, look to the empty tomb. Look at the inability of the Romans to produce a body. Or they'll say, look at the change in the disciples. Well, the apostles didn't say that. And those pieces of evidence are important. Don't get me wrong. We should use them. But they're not going to convince anybody. They didn't strive to prove the resurrection. They just told people about it. And what is the power of God into salvation? The resurrection? That's part, that's part of what I'm looking for. It's a one word. Or, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Not producing facts, but the gospel message. Uh, Paul says in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, that it's the foolishness of the message preached that people come under conviction and are saved. Their confidence and our confidence ought to be in Christ and not in our ability to proclaim Him. We should proclaim Him. And I've heard that um, when Jonathan Edwards preached, he was so nearsighted he had to get it his sermon up like this and he sort of mumbled through it and yet people were in the floor dying because they were apart from God. I don't know if that's true or not. I wasn't there. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> the vast majority of people that have come to Christ, including the intellectual ones, were not convinced by these five facts. Okay? They were convinced by the proclamation of of the scripture. I'm just going to give you one example. Augustine. He knew that he was doing wrong. But one day he was in his yard and he heard a little girl singing. I don't know how close she was, but take up and read. Take up and read. And he picked up the Bible and started reading it and was converted. The gospel message converted. When I was a kid, I was converted by reading the gospel. And uh, see, my mother had these Bibles and stuff in her house. But nobody ever sat down to me except Mom did on a couple occasions. And I, one story, I, there were two stories she told me. One was about the little match girl. Have you ever heard that one? The little match girl? You may or may not. And I'm not even sure all the details. But another one was a, of an old woman had a son. And. Uh, he was going to die. He was a little boy. And God said, I'm, I can take him now or he can grow up and he's going to become a criminal. And she would not part with her son and he grew up and became a criminal. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not either. But those are the kind of things I heard from my mother. Not so much from my father. But anyway, um, I became a Christian by reading the Bible. <clears throat> the vast majority have not come because they knew facts but because they read the gospel they heard the gospel they heard it proclaimed and the Holy Spirit won them Paul said I planted Apollos came along and watered but only God gave the increase we cannot win anybody to Christ only God can do that so 
How do we know that the resurrection is true? You say, tell me already, okay? It's because we've been born again. When we're born again, God reveals to us that the resurrection is true. You say, what about all these people that are in the church that don't believe in the bodily resurrection? They're not saved. They're not saved. They've never been born again because they don't know Christ. He gives us that conviction of the resurrection. We know because the Holy Spirit, this, this is what it says, His Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we're saved. And we're in union with Him. We died with Him and we rose again with Him. When I used to debate atheists, and I don't do that anymore, I'm kind of like you, I don't want to do it anymore. Maybe one day I'll be led to do it, I don't know. But the one thing they don't like you to tell them is what I've just told you. They want you to bring out your five facts so they can pick those apart if they can. And they all have the same story. But they can't get over the fact that your spirit witnesses with the Holy Spirit. They can't get past that. They don't believe it. They, they say, how can... I said, we know because we know. <clears throat> we know. It's like, how do you know you're in love with your wife? You just know. Okay? <laughs> right? You just know. You know, people will not come to faith because I'm a great preacher because I'm not. I just preach what God wants me to preach. But as Paul said in the second Corinthians four six, it is God who commanded his life to come in your life to bring you alive so that you could see him and glorify him. And behold, as it says in Second Corinthians three eighteen, behold his face. That's where we see the glory. We must cling to the truth that only the gospel can save. We cannot convince people. You say, okay, well now what are the five things you want to tell us about? Okay, I'm going to make it kind of short. First, he was executed. They all begin with an E. First, Jesus was executed. It's, it's a, one of the best ancient historical facts Two, early proclamation. What, within a week? They were saying, He's risen! Three days! He's risen! And then the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost. Three, empty tomb. They can all go check it out. He, Paul said, there's over 500 people that saw Him alive. And most of them are still alive. You can go check out the tomb or you can go ask these people. Because... They could not produce a body. Four eyewitnesses, over 500 of them, and five, the endurance of the church. It's been 2,000 years, almost. You know, if you walked down one night to the graveyard and somebody got up out of the graveyard and you went and told all your friends, they'd say, yeah, right. What you been drinking? What you been smoking? If two of you go down there, they might go check it out. If there's three for sure, they go check it out. But if there's over 500 people that saw it at one time, it's true. You can't hallucinate that many people at one time. Now, the reason I say that is because even though our primary witness is that we're born again, ignorance is not a virtue. And that can confirm, mostly confirm it to you and me that Jesus is who He says He is. But see, people do not reject Christ because it's true. It's not true. They, they don't reject Him for that. Romans 1 gives us a reason. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth with their sin. 
They would rather sin than glorify God. Only the Holy Spirit can change that desire in that heart from glorifying self to glorifying Jesus. Remember, Jesus predicted His resurrection on numerous occasions to His disciples, but they didn't really believe it until they got the Holy Spirit. They saw Him physically, and then ten days later after He had gone, they were endowed on high, and as John 16 says, He will teach you all things. So in a very real way, His resurrection, His endowment with the Holy Spirit, as laid out in John 5, 24-25, where it says, those that trust in Christ have already passed from death to life. And he says, and there is a day coming, and now is when those who hear will rise. And he's talking about a spiritual resurrection which is pointing to the physical resurrection. Because all those that are born again will rise again. Amen. You have two births, one death. Those that reject Christ have one birth and two deaths. So the question is, when that moment in the twinkling of an eye, are you going to be changed? Or are you going to be left in your corrupt body? Because on that day, the mortal will put on immortality and the corrupt will change to incorruption. The question is, are you born again? And how do you know? It's because your spirit witnesses with his spirit. And I want to leave you with this thought from our good friend Titus. Where he says, But when the kindness, this is from the third chapter, and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. May God add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his word.